This is the last session it has last pointed out. Um, but we had a very lively start this morning, and hopefully it's going to be a lively end. But having chatted with our three uh, guests, it's certainly going to be lively, and we will see where we're going to get at the end of that session. And this is going to be an issue like the ones that you had with the uh, top swimmers. We're going to open up the discussions there and, and get uh, your views and uh, uh, your contributions there. So we have three speakers. One is Gianni Merlo. Gianni is um, a well-known journalist, a seasoned journalist, and at the moment president of AIPS, that is the International Sports Press Association. And of course, he also works for La Gazzetta dello Sport uh, in um, Italy. Uh, he's been correspondent for the Olympic Games for over 20 years. And of course, he's very passionate um, about sport generally and, uh, in very many ways. And uh, you will realize that I'm not telling you any lies when you hear him speak. And then, of course, we got uh, Shane Tassup, uh, we are very delighted to have you, Shane. Uh, Shane, of course, as you know, maybe you don't know Shane. Maybe you know Katinka Hosu. Well, Shane is the one who is the coach and managing Katinka Hosu. So you know that um, without a, a, a good coach, uh, Katinka Hosu has just been announced as a millionaire, dollar millionaire. And I don't know how much of that... Uh, Shane's going to get. Uh, <laughs> um, and of course, uh, he's been you know, involved in um, yeah, out of the box approach to training and racing throughout the season and has been the topic of much discussion. He has openly pushed the need for swimmers, biggest stars, to compete more often at the top level in order to push the sports towards a more professional plane. And then we have Michael Scott. Michael Scott is presently um, the performance director for Swimming Australia, one of the top swimming nations in the world, and always has been, um, despite what little has happened in uh, London. But I'm certain Michael is going to um, uh, make sure that they get on the top of that. And in his role, uh, Michael uh, leads the development and implement implementation of high-performance strategic plan for the senior youth and talent programs for Olympic pool and open water disciplines, as well as Paralympic program. And that is something also passionate, uh, that I have a great passion for is Paralympic uh, sport, uh, Michael. Uh, he also serves as a CEO of the World Swimming Championships uh, Corporation, FINA World Championships in Melbourne that we had not very long ago. So firstly, I'm going to ask three of them to put forward this topic of discussion, which is now moving aquatic forward. So we will start with Gianni. You'll realize by their particular uh, passion uh, that uh, they are deeply involved, and I'm hoping that the sermons are not going to be too long. Gianni? No, I, I, sorry. Thank you to everybody to be here in this cold room. I think that. Uh, Swimming is living a, a, a really a golden year in this moment, and we can see for, even from this convention, because uh, I was at the first time at the convention in uh, Mar del Plata, and now we can see how it's developing. So it means that this world of swimming is uh, running now, is running very fast. Thanks to the result of, of in, in the competition, but thanks also to the organization, I guess. I think that in the past, in the last past years, uh, especially in the last 10 years, many things are changed. There was a lot of debate. I, I, I remember the debate about the swimsuit that was helpful because the attention of the world was attracted by them. Because I think that uh, swimming now is, it, it is uh, come out from what is the old niche of before, because in my newspaper, uh, always uh, swimming, it, it was uh, considered, especially at the Olympics, at the World Championship, and sometimes at the Italian Championship. But for the rest, there was 
very few space on the newspaper. Now, swimming in our newspaper and Gazette dello Sport is one of the most important sports. Why? Because the athlete became more popular, because there was a lot of more debate, because there is also the new technology that helps. And there is also the new idea that are helping. The athlete, sometimes, before we, we, we were discussing about, sometimes are uh, object of gossip. Yes, are negative, the gossip sometimes, but sometimes are helping to uh, attract the attention of the people. The people that are not fan of swimming yet, but they will become step by step because this uh, new hero sometimes will be followed by the new generation. Because after the new generation and the young kids are looking at television, they want to become as Phelps as anybody. And this is something that uh, uh, FINA is doing very well. And after we have published with here uh, our association as 10 young reporters that are experienced the world of swimming now. And from their enthusiasm, they are not specialists in swimming, but from their enthusiasm to talk with the people, to learn about this, it looks that swimming as a future, because it's the interest that is important. And after, we have published also an interview with uh, Professor Manson that what else will come out from, uh, for, for, for uh, for swimming. For example, he was speaking about possible sensor in the swimsuit to have the pulse and the, and the blood pressure re result to have also an impression of how the body of an athlete is uh, uh, reacting under the, in, in the competition, in the water, in the moment in, in which he is uh, training and after how in the moment in which he is competing at the top level, how is his heart, no? And after there are also other studies regarding, one day he said maybe that there will be the lapse time in the, in the Googles of, of, of the swimmer to know exactly at which pace they are going. I think that these are all, always interesting things that are showing that swimming is looking to the future and this is very positive from my point of view. Thank you. Thank you. other members and uh, let's now hear Shane's view and, and how he believes that we could move swimming forward. Hello. Uh, thank you all for thank you all for coming this afternoon. I know it's the last one so a little rough but um, to be completely honest I think we're doing a good job with the technology and everything pushing the sport forward. We have uh, companies outside that are doing great jobs to push technology and FINA's done a fantastic job to keep the marketing and the, the press is always very involved in what we're doing. Um, I don't think we're not doing a good job with that stuff. I think we are very much limiting our own success in what we're doing. Uh, and by that I mean in our mentality of how we approach the sport and therefore how everyone else sees our sport. Um, we basically are our sport is an Olympic sport, and specific, I'm, I'm, I'm swimming, so I, I talk from a swimming standpoint, but our sport is, a, is an Olympic sport in which the overarching goal is an Olympic gold medal. If we don't get an Olympic gold medal, you are either good or bad, depending on what happens. So you have an Olympic gold medal, you're set. If you don't have an Olympic gold medal, nobody wants to talk to you. So, and I can, I'm telling you as a, as a perspective of Katinka did not get an Olympic gold medal or a medal for that matter in 2012. And sponsors do not want to deal with her. Other than Arena and some of the many of the sponsors we've worked with in swimming who know her value, many of the swimming, or many of the sponsors outside of that don't want to deal with her because she doesn't have an Olympic medal, therefore she's not good. In every interview we deal with, they talk about how, oh yeah, well you don't have an Olympic medal so you're only second tier. Uh, governing bodies deal with us as second tier because she doesn't have an Olympic medal. And frankly, the way we're going, I don't care if she gets an Olympic medal ever. I will prep her to get an Olympic medal. We will swim the Olympics as every other competition we've swam with the intent to win. It is a race. That is our sport. It is the race. But this obsession over Olympic gold medal makes athletes take years out of their lives to focus solely on the expectation of winning one race or one competition for a week out of their life when they don't compete. We therefore take athletes out of competitions during the year in order to set them so they don't peak or screw up any racing at the end of the Olympics or during that year. We have athletes that swim four years and train 
obsessively for four years to finally get a gold medal, and then they turn around, and when they finally have the thing they needed, they're so burnt out that they can't use that to do business, to get back involved in the sport, to do something else, to continue to train, to compete. Their, at, their, year, their career gets shut down to four years. You wonder why very few athletes have double one, two years in a row, or two Olympics in a row. It's because it's so difficult to continue to do what they did the first four years for another four years. We are limiting our athletes potential by being so obsessed with Olympic gold. The Olympics will not decline in speed, in quality, in excitement. It'll actually get more exciting because we should be pushing them to swim more often and at the highest level, more consistently, in more world championships, in more the World Cup, eight stops, where we can go all over the world. And these athletes can therefore build personal brands, they can build professional brands, they can interact with sponsors and the fans at each stop of the way, they can interact, the kids can see them live, and people will actually want to start watching more often because, like you said with the press, we're, we have a reason to be in the press that's not negative, besides gossip, besides, uh, you know, doing stupid media stunts. We get in there for our results, we get in there for being like NBA basketball. They're in their 82, 86 games a season, and they have a reason to be in the media all the time. You start to see their personality and what they're doing on a daily basis. And we simply can't take our eyes off the ultimate prize, which, is it really? Is, well, I, I will not walk away from my career with Katinka saying I was a failure if she turned around and got no gold medal, or she didn't get a medal. What if three people, or one person for a gold medal, was simply better than her that day? I should say that the last four years of what we did was complete garbage and that it was a waste of my time and her time because she didn't get an Olympic gold medal. Because of my view, she's now a millionaire. So more athletes should be doing this and making careers for themselves in a sport where you will continue to push the, the average age of a competing athlete higher because they're making careers for themselves and they can continue to do what they love and they get involved. We have higher competition, more people involved, and people continue to get back involved in the sport because they continue to love the sport for what it is truly meant to love it for. Thank you, thanks Shane. Um, before we open it up, and you know, two of you have given us uh, a, a, a wonderful exposure, uh, let's hear uh, Michael first, and then we'll get questions and contributions from the floor. Michael? Thank you. Uh, first of all, what I'd like to say, my philosophy is that our, our greatest asset are our swimmers. And they're supported on, on a daily basis by dedicated coaches. My job as performance director in uh, Swimming Australia, and I, I held a similar role in Britain, is uh, to, to build the strategy, the structure and the funding uh, for, in this instance, Australia to be a top swimming nation. Many countries in the world have a funding system uh, where they get their money from government solely based on what they do at the Olympic Games every four years. And prior to my arrival in Australia, uh, Australia uh, didn't achieve its performance goals as a team in London. Uh, the, the program lost half a million dollars per year. The head coach lost his job because of the collective results of the Australian team in one event. Um, so a key, a key challenge in building the FINA brand and the product that it has is that a lot of national federations are funded by their national governments to get results in Olympic Games. I know clearly that works in, in, you know, uh, in Australia, I know it works in Britain, in Canada, in New Zealand, uh, and many European countries as well. Like a lot of things in life, it is about getting the healthy balance. Uh, we need to, uh, we need to uh, our athletes racing more regularly, and we need them racing to build uh, the profile, their profile, and the profile of the sport. So uh, going forward, the big challenge is getting that healthy balance between uh, individuals succeeding and being rewarded financially and uh, the national federations getting the funding from their governments and their sponsors, which is solely driven on uh, an Olympic Games. Thanks, Michael. There you are, you had uh, uh, three prominent uh, uh, areas of discussion. Uh, I've got a few questions, but first let's hear what you say and 
what you believe is important to move swimming forward, and then I'll make a bit of a contribution. Any takers? Just jump out of seats. Not yet? Right. Okay, okay, let me see whether I could provoke some questions from you. Now, if you looked at, now, uh, Shane talked about the NBA, uh, that they continuously play all the time, and there is an activity. The same thing happens in football. In some parts of the world, you call it soccer. I don't like the word soccer. To me, that's a very Philistine uh, way of uh, uh, purifying sport. But um, th those are issues which are important. Now, this happens in football. We, we hear about it, we talk about it, we see it all the time, and same with the NBA. Not so much in the rest of the world, but especially in the United States. And they've done an excellent job how they do it. And um, uh, Sasha Popov talked yesterday about uh, how useful they are. Now, the issue here is when you look at all these issues, they are largely entertainment. Now, we moved away from sport, which uh, our three prominent uh, guests here have talked about. And it has become entertainment. Sport has become entertainment. And therefore, to attract people into the sport, which is our sport, it's swimming, we also have to be part of that entertainment industry. Is that right? Is that wrong? I'd like to hear your views on that. And also, the issue of which um, the um, uh, uh, swimmers talked about yesterday is that not only can we take swimming forward by looking at what's happening in the pool or what's happening in what we call the field of play, is what's happened outside the, the field of play, what happens at the spectator point of view. But as you know now, spectator point of view is essential. We want a full stand, but full stand also means getting very much more exposure because to a large extent, unlike football, which can take 60, 70,000 spectators at, at the same time, you know, we are restricted simply because of the, the arena that we work with. For instance, in Sydney, uh, many of you might have been there, I went right up to the very top stand and that was 100 meters away uh, from where the, the pool activities were taking place. So we have these particular restrictions. Let's see whether I provoked, uh, and the three or four of us have provoked you to something else now. Harold uh, from Mauritius. Thank you. Sam, I think I agree 100% with what you just said. I am of the opinion that swimming there has been some improvement, but what I would define as improvement within the box. And any improvement out of the box, I would define as innovation. So I don't think really we've had enough innovation. That's one thing. Secondly, I think we need to try to think how to make it really more of a spectacle and I think we should think more of a spectator. My opinion is that a lot of improvement has been done always in terms of performance. Always trying to get the swimmer to improve their times. Always trying to beat the world record. But I've not seen anything being done in swimming to attract people to come. Just like soccer, just like basketball, or any other sporting uh, activity. So I don't have the solution here, but I'm just trying to say, guys, I think we should think about it. I don't know, maybe one solution is that FINA should probably bring in some expert in uh, entertainment and ask them, what should we do about swimming to get more people to come and watch it? One little observation is the swimmers that were invited yesterday to come and share their experience. Whether it is by coincidence or not, but they're all sprinters, 100 meters, 200 meters swimmers. What does that mean? 
people recognize sprinters as being stars. But one question I asked to the floor, do you guys remember all the big swimmers who won the 800 meters and the 1500 meters? Okay. It seems that they win and then the next day everybody forget about them. Why is that? Is it because it is not exciting enough? And my personal observation, when you watch 800 meters and 1500 meters, looks like after 400 meters, you already know who is going to be the winner. And then you start losing interest. And again, the question is why? Why is it? Because we don't have enough swimmers who, who train for these, uh, for these uh, 800 and 1500 meters? I don't know, but you see, I mean, I just want to share some views. Yeah. Sam. There. Thank you, Thank Harold. You. Shall we start, Michael? Um, if you were at the Pan Pax this year, some of the best racing was done by a, uh, an 800 and 1500 swimmer from the USA, Katie Ledecky, uh, most uh, entertaining and, and uh, racing uh, that I've ever seen on how strong she was and how controlled she was in the race. So I believe in terms of a, a, an entertainment factor that we do have tools that we've got to get to the media to, uh, I guess, entertain the spectators both uh, in the stands and on television. And we have that, every country has biomechanic systems, performance analysis systems, and it's how, how we get that information out in um, layman's terms to educate uh, the spectators in the stands and uh, uh, the people on television sets. In, in Australia, uh, we have a, a strong, uh, traditionally a strong distance culture, uh, but, uh, and the nation would stop uh, to watch traditionally the 1500 meter final, sorry, during the, during the trials each four years and it go live on national television, the only event that would. So it depends on the culture of the country uh, and it depends on the success of your athletes. And to me, uh, one of the key things is success breeds success. Uh, and um, having, whether it's at an international level or national level, the more superstars we have, uh, and the more, super, uh, the more successful the sport will be, it will grow. Shane? Uh, I, think what, oh, I think what he was saying is exactly correct. And to add to what he's saying, and in uh, argument with what you're bringing up, you need to look at that as part of what we've created as a culture. Because what we've created has turned into athletes will sacrifice paydays or competitions in order to win one event or to swim at one race one time fast you start creating the, the one thing I've noticed that creates a lot of entertainment is an athlete not willing not worrying about failing not worrying about losing a race or losing their best race because they want to swim in multiple races you want a spectacle talk about Katinka getting up in 10 races this week or talk about her during the World Cup swimming 14 races in two days swimming against fresh athletes because frankly that's what she's geared to do. She's geared to race. We are swimmers, or, or at least I was a swimmer, and we work with swimmers and athletes. And if they're going to race, they should want to race. They shouldn't be afraid. But unfortunately, our culture has whittled it down to don't lose. Turning around to saying, win the Olympic gold or you are horrible, or win Olympic medal and you're not good enough, or winning a race at world championships, but don't swim if you can't win. And I don't agree that 1,500 people and 800 people are not the exciting people because there's been fantastic races that I've grown up watching in the 800 and 1500s. And I think that it's simply a matter of us getting our athletes to work at or encouraging to race hard and race often and not be afraid of failure, that we should be backing them to go after what they think they can do. Thanks, Shane. Gianni? Uh, <clears throat> I think that now we have listen to the word of the people that are coaches or are, 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 uh, technical high level. To, to look from the side of, of the people, of the spectator, sometimes it's different. There are two, two different points of view because the spectator are looking for a champion that is also a character that give also other impression, not only technical. The, 15, the 1500 remind me the the problem of 10,000 meters in athletics is the same. Now are under a threat 
because they are too long, the television doesn't want them because it's too long, even the 15 meters. After the person that are looking in television, they can go to, 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 to drink a coffee and come back and the situation is very similar sometimes. But it is not how long is a competition. Because the quicker competition are always more in, in the fantasy of the people because are quick, are Im immediate. 100 meters, 50 meters, uh, 200 meters, I even in other sports are, are the best, usually, for the at attraction of the people. Now the problem is how the, swim, the, the swimming can build new champion, because the most important thing is not to, ra uh, to race against the record, but to race an, against a, an, another competitor. Because if, uh, for example, the top American, now I, 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 I speak about Phelps, that was a, 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 the icon, is competing before against an Hungarian, against an Italian, against a French, and they are dueling in, in competition. After, Phelps will be popular always in, in other country, and also the man that is opposite to Phelps will become popular even in USA. It's, it's something that is related. You, you have to build the champion, to build the, the, the people that can be the great actor of sport, in, in, the, in the good sense actor, because we, we need very good performer also outside the swimming pool, people that can speak, can smile, can give a, a feeling to the spectator. If not, the sport, is very boring. It's good only for the for the coaches and for the athlete, because the coaches they must be focused only on, on the competition and only on the result. There are other the official that has to think about the entertainment. The entertainment will bring also some negative aspect, but the entertainment will attract the attention of other million of people, and between these other million of people, there will be the the fails of the future. Yeah, thanks, Gianni. The issue is, you know, we all talked about uh, uh, spectator involvement, uh, uh, participant involvement, but there should, there must be a congruency of what the spectators want, how they want it, what the swimmers want, how they want it, and also how the television wants it, and what do the, what does the television want? Unfortunately, we live in this entertainment world now. And there must be this concrude, concrudency, and without this concrudency, we cannot get that. And I don't know whether I've opened up uh, a further issue of a debate, but uh, later on we'll talk about uh, what Gianni mentioned about an icon like um, Michael Phelps, and how can swimming use these icons? For instance, at the moment, um, track and field, IAAF, uses uh, um, Hussein Bolt has an icon that benefits Hussein Bolt and that benefits athletics. How can we do that with swimming too? At the moment, sadly, we've lost um, uh, the, the most famous icon in Phelps. But we have other icons, you know, like Husu, we've got uh, Chad uh, Laclau. Now, how can we use those particular icons to try and get this congruency from uh, spectators, television, and from the participants, because they all become part of one particular issue. And this is what's happening in other sports. And Shane pointed this out a lot regarding NBA. Unfortunately, we don't see NBA as much as we see it in the United States. But we see a lot of football. And football has the same type of uh, attitude, that you, you need TV, you need spectators, and you need participants. Any takers? Ricardo. Yes, good evening. <clears throat> uh, I have a question for uh, the two coaches. Uh, even though I would like to uh, say that maybe to compare swimming to team sport like NBA or, or football, I don't think is the right direction to take because of the nature of the sport and the nature of the entertainment. But the question is, uh, you mentioned like the Olympics being the only big uh, scene for athletes uh, to show up, which is every four years. It is too little of uh, occasion for them to shine and too much, is, too much weight is put on the Olympics.
But how do you cope with the fact that swimming is such a demanding sport? How can you raise the number of occasion of the level of Olympics, preserving the health and the caliber of this swimmer? Usain Bolt is great, is an icon, but we have to wait for him at the World Championship and the Olympics. Is that possible to push the body of a swimmer, which is not a football player, he works much harder, to the level to have the swimmer performing at that level maybe two or three, four times a year to create that entertainment environment that you look, you're talking about? Thanks. Um, just to clarify, I use the NBA as an example because that is a governing body which is doing a, probably what I would consider the greatest job anyone else is doing in the world right now in interacting amongst their players, their sponsors, they're continuing to get involvement with their sponsors with, to the point where you don't even notice. But yet these sponsors are extremely happy with the marketing. These NBA players are able to do what they want to do with their businesses. They have sponsors interconnecting, as Adidas is the sponsor of the entire NBA, but uh, LeBron James, an example, can be the sponsored personally by Nike. So that everyone that is at a level in which they can get paid is getting paid. And athletes can do business as they need to do. They also play 86 games a year. That You are correct. They are a team aspect. And unfortunately, swimming will probably, at least not as long as I'm around, see anything which is considered a team aspect. Um, where you can bring fans together under one roof and under a one team's name. Uh, that is unfortunate, but many of the business aspects and many of the competition aspects are exactly the same. And they're, they're a very good model for us to follow as they are very savvy with how they're doing things. And we can learn a lot from looking at them. Obviously, the structure of the sport is different. We're, we're different than a lot of places. Also, to clarify, you brought up about Usain Bolt. He also performs at the Diamond League, which is almost identical and is a similar structure to what FINA is trying to do with the World Cup. Um, an example of you wanting someone to train at a high level or compete at a high level three to four times, I have Katinka training or racing at a high level probably closer to eight or ten times a year. Um, there are still two times that I'm trying to hit best times, that I'm trying to, two times a year I'm trying to hit all time best times, and there's probably more times where I've got her in a position where she will perform at a very, very high level with very fast times, but it's still part of what I'm doing and it's still part of the program going forward. I say don't focus on the Olympics, but I didn't say don't compete there with the intent to win. I 100% will walk away from the Olympics knowing I gave everything I could to her and put her in the best position possible to walk away with as many Olympic gold medals as possible. I'm a competitor, she's a competitor. When it comes down to it, we want to win the ultimate goal, which is an Olympic gold medal. It's a big competition. But I won't be crying in my milk if I don't win it, or she doesn't win it, should I say. It's more about the idea that my program has been about business as, long, as much as performance, as much as sport and entertainment. And she needs to function at that level. LeBron James takes care of business also. And we have been so uh, oppressive of our athletes that they haven't been able to do what they need to do. They, they're a physical, like the physical body can handle a lot. And we can push it to its limits. I don't know if we've seen what the limits are. And they can compete at a high level at a very, very often, and they can train. Racing is also part of training. It's crazy to think that they're swimmers and they should swim once. They're swimmers. They race for a living, but they're going to race once a year, twice a year. It, but that's what they're geared to do. That's what they're actually training for. So why? How will you get close to race pace? How do you? What's the better training than actually doing the race? We can do 10 200s butterfly in practice, but I can't have her do a 200 butterfly against one of the best in the world for money. Oh, yeah, that seems crazy to me. So it is possible. It's thinking outside the box, and that's one thing I pride in myself, and I will not think inside the box. I constantly try and challenge the system, and I think it's something we should all be doing as a whole because I say don't focus on the Olympics, but like he's mentioned, it, that's the funding for a lot of programs. So I can't just say don't get Olympic gold, don't get paid, but it's a system why we're all kind of creating this program where it's hard for us to move forward in a, uh, towards an NBA style or towards a track style. But that's what we need to do. Yeah. Michael, any contribution? And then we'll get Gianni. Yeah. The, the, for me, the opportunity to race more exists in short course. Um, uh, to do 
uh, the same approach in long course uh, would be a lot more physically uh, demanding. And also from a national federation perspective, we see short courses the opportunity to develop and fine tune our, our skills and technique. Uh, so uh, our approach to short course uh, World Cups is it, it's, it's an opportunity to race more, uh, to improve our skills. As a swimming nation, Australia is, is very strong in what we call free swimming and very poor in technical skills. So underwater work, turns, starts. So for us to achieve our aspirational goal of being a top swimming nation, we need to use the short course competition more. Uh, FINA has, uh, through the short course uh, program, introduced some innovations. And I think being innovative is, is critical for the sport to grow. Uh, a lot of people, uh, I, I guess, turned their nose up when, with the introduction of the mixed relays. And the first short course uh, World Cup I went to, I was amazed at how entertaining they were uh, and the frequency of, the, of how the lead changed between competitors. And, and those are the sorts of innovations that I think swimming can, ex, can explore during the short course World Cup series. So for swimming to grow, it has to be innovative. Swimming has grown, but what innovations can we bring in via the FINA World Cups to make the sport more, more prominent uh, uh, going forward? Thanks, Michael. Gianni? No, I think that uh, is a problem of how to organize because uh, Sean has spoken about the Diamond League in athletics, but it is very difficult to reproduce Diamond League because, for example, in athletics it's too long. And uh, even uh, athletes as the top as Usain Bolt, instead to compete in uh, 14 uh, competition, they compete three, four, five times in a year because there is the problem of training, how to reach the top in, in the training and so on. No, one thing that uh, swimming has, on my point of view, that is very interesting is the fact that your athlete can compete in more, dif uh, dif uh, more different discipline compared to other sports. Because in other sports, it can never happen that a a an athlete can win eight uh, medals, because it's impossible. And, but this is something that you, you can use more because uh, the, the really the icon, the top athlete, can compete on diff, with different champions of different country, and this can, can, can give a new boost to the interest in different country. It's very important because, for example, now in Italy, one of the most important sport uh, image at all, even better, uh, she is more important now than some, some football player, is uh, Federica Pellegrini. Why? Because she is very good inside the pool and also outside the pool. She is, now she became a kind of icon. So the problem is how to study your champion and how to push the one that has more talent or more skill also outside the pool to be more in television, more with the, with the journalist to speak about their story because many of them are, have wonderful sport, story in their life. But nobody knows, and this is a mistake. I think that this can, can be improved a lot. Yeah. You see, the other issue with Shane hit the nail on the head. And of course, he's a coach. Now, I don't know whether all the other coaches will agree with him, but I certainly agree with Shane. Because in the beginning, when FINA started with the World Championship, the first one was in Belgrade in 1973. It was over a four-year period. Now we have it every two years. And in between, we have the short course uh, uh, championship. So there is activity every year. But is there enough activity in that year, which Shane talked about? Now, the, the issue is you know, some coaches worry about peaking all the time. And you know, can they peak more often than presently peaking? And Shane hit the nail on the head. You know, what's the difference between doing uh, um, uh, 10, 100 uh, at a training session and uh, 100 at a um, uh, uh, championship. So, you know, and, and of course, in uh, very many events, now especially whether we like it or not, uh, with due respect to other elements of swimming, like water polo, synchro, diving, uh, etc., we must accept, and, and this comes out quite often, 
The, the blue ribbon events are swimming events, are the events of speed swimming. That is where the stars are. And we don't know how many stars there are in the other uh, spheres, simply because we don't know them, they're not publicized if they are stars. But we know the stars. We know almost of the stars in, the, in, in, the, in swimming, in the swimming events. Now, how can we use those particular stars to project swimming on a broader basis? This morning, we talked about sport for all, uh, swimming for all. You know, how can what we are doing now at this very top level match up with what is happening at the very low level, or what's happening at the very low level match up with what's happening at the very top level? Can we integrate all these elements together for us to go forward? There's a lady there, I think I had a hand up. Oh, oh, okay. Hello. So this question will be more for Michael and Shane. Um, let's say direct, we get to the point that we can actually make a career out of swimming more swimmers, not just the top three, let's say, or top five swimmers in the world can make careers. Um, do you think the average age of peak performance can go much higher and how high could it go and how could it benefit swimming? You go last, sir. You go last, Shane. Uh, definitely. Uh, when when I, uh, I was a swimmer in Australia and um, in, in, in the early 70s and the, the culture and the attitude in Australia that was that time was that once you went to university, you retired from swimming and you lost the majority of swimmers around 18, 19 years of age. I was fortunate, I went to the US on a, on a college scholarship uh, and, and then coached over there, so my experience from swimming was a lot longer than a lot of my friends. Now we're finding in Australia, uh, because of funding, both private sector and government funding, that our athletes are making good money just from Swimming Australia without, any, uh, without counting any commercial uh, revenue that they get from sponsors and prize money from FINA, etc. So we're finding that swimmers in Australia, the age is increasing every year. Swimmers are staying longer in the sport because of the financial return that they get internationally and nationally. And I know that doesn't apply in each country, but our swimmers are well looked after. Uh, so with that support, uh, financial support, it enables them to stay in the sport longer and peak longer because they're getting the financial return uh, way beyond what people saw was uh, the physical boundaries before. So a lot of that has been psychological, in my view, and not physiological. So uh, with the rewards and the system changing and improved ways of training, uh, recovery, etc., swimmers are staying in the sport a lot longer. I think that uh, the new opportunity to have a better life as uh, make longer the, the, the life of, of a swimmer, of an athlete in, in every sport. Because, and what, we, we, what is uh, very funny is that the, the people that uh, can become older, in, in, usually in sport, are usually the sprinter. Before the sprinter in America and uh, in Australia, they, they finish very early. Now we have sprinter of 32, 30, till 35 years old. Why? Because there is the experience, the training, that, the training that also pay after some years. Because that now it's, it's changed also the methodology, the, the, the way in which people are coaching and people are training. There is a, 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 new, a new system. And I think that in the future, the age will, go, will grow again, especially if there, there are very good financial uh, situation. And this is good for the sport. Because when, uh, when in the 60s or in the 70s, the athlete, af after the school, they have to go to work. They cannot train uh, six hours a day w without any salary, you know? N now, uh, thanks to the sponsors, thanks to the federations, thanks to, thanks to the government, the situation is completely changed. And the good example also are going also in, in other countries. And I think that what uh, you have discussed this morning regarding the sport for all, is very, is very important because if uh, this campaign will save only one life, will be a, already a big success. And beginning to saving the life, other people will go in, in the swimming pool, in the school, is necessary that the kids 
can grow uh, learning swimming because it's necessary. It's, it's a social problem. And from, from this social problem, uh, swimming can, have, can find also from, from here new champion. It's normal because you will have more people beginning and some of them will, be, will become fan. And, and this I think that is a very important moment for your sport because there is a new possibility of development from my point of view. I think, that, to be completely honest, it's a huge issue in our sport. Um, Michael is talking about how many of the swimmers from Australia make good money. We also need to understand that for you guys, swimming has been one of your national sports for a very, very long time. Um, and it's been well known that you guys take care of your swimmers. Unfortunately, that doesn't go across the entire world. Um, but that is one of the big things for us. If we can, in some manner, put more money into the sport, we can encourage more athletes to continue to train, continue to compete at the highest level. If you look at people like, for my example, would be Roland Schumann. He's an unbelievable talent. He is experienced beyond belief. And he is living off his experience right now. And he's making money at the World Cup. And he would be here if he could be. And he compete and he would raise the level. He may not be the one that South Africa is going to have to win the gold medal, but he will push Chad Lacoste, per se, to be faster. And if Chad doesn't keep, it, keep an eye out, Roland will take the title from him in a heartbeat. That makes more excitement. That, makes, that means that the competition is higher to qualify for different competitions. Right now, my example is Hungary. They don't have enough swimmers to generate a Olympic trials like the US. And, because of country size, we probably never will. But if you can keep swimmers in the game, then the US continues to grow because in-house competition is even higher. Therefore, the media is more excited. Therefore, everything goes around in a circle. Right now, we're stuck in a complete cycle where we all need each other to move forward. And part of that is continuing to make sure in some way we get our athletes paid. Australia does a fantastic job of it, making sure that their athletes get well taken care of where they can make fantastic livings. Not all athletes have been able to do that, such as Roland, who may not be making the best money in the world, but he loves what he does and he makes enough money to justify continuing to move on in the sport. But many athletes I've seen couldn't justify it. Larson Jensen was an amazing 1500 swimmer. And he told me at USC the day he graduated and I asked him if he was gonna continue. He said, Shane, I can't justify it because I can't make enough, as good as I am, I can't make enough money to justify me not working or moving forward in my life or doing something else to move forward. So someone that, that was that good couldn't justify it. And that's been a huge problem for us as a whole. Our, our average age, we talk about how Katinka's old at 25, and you know she has one Olympics in her. I bet she has two. Maybe a third if she wants to, because the average age will go higher. She can continue to focus for six, eight hours a day and not have a problem with it because she's living off the sport. And we should be getting more athletes like her to find ways for them to make, to make money, whether it's competing and making them race more often, or if we can find some structure that doesn't obsessively uh, focus on Olympic gold. Because then we'll create more competition, more excitement, more media coverage, which is extremely valuable. And then we'll turn around and we'll create more sponsors, more money, and it goes around the cycle to where we get to somewhere like the NBA. And we have people looking at us, and the media wants to be involved in these people's lives. But not just Katinka's life, or not just Chad's, or Roland's, or we need the other people. We need eighth place. We need people to care about eighth place person's life. They have to be someone too, because you talk about the NBA with the team. That only benefits us because they have five people on the team on the court. They have 11 people on the, on the bench. They're sitting there with a whole bunch of people, and I might be a fan of the guy sitting on the bench. He might have been someone I went to high school with. But I care about him, and I care about the team because of him. So there's a million people bringing different people, or there's different people bringing a million different people to watch at one team for whatever the purpose. You don't have to like the best player on the team. You didn't have to like Michael Jordan. You could have liked Scottie Pippen. You could have liked Dennis Rodman. Didn't matter who you liked, but you liked the team. We don't have teams, so we have to find ways for them to like other athletes, and we have to keep the name brand athletes in the game. Someone like. We need people to be able to create brands. The longer you're in the sport, the more of a brand you can, you can create. Fellabrici Pellegrini is a perfect example of that. She's huge now in Italy. And part of that is, yes, she's fantastic in the pool. The other part is she's been in the media a ton, but she's had time to create a brand. She wasn't bigger than soccer players when she first started, but because she's been around doing things day in, day out, 
she's continuing to perform. Last year, she won gold in the, in the short course Europeans, which was huge for her. Then she won silver, I believe, at the uh, World Championships. All fantastic for her in her career. But it wasn't her first, and it was not the first time she did it. It was a long, extended career. There was fans behind her, new fans coming, people loving the story behind her. There has to be a story for people to be interested in and it has to be a personal brand. It's all about brands and treating this as commerce. Thanks, uh, Michael wants to make a little contribution. Uh -oh. And then we'll have one more question, and we'll, we'll try and wind up. That's David will be the last one. One minute, we'll wait for Michael to finish uh, making his presentation, David. Just one quick comment in regard to swimmers staying in the sport longer. With that, which, which I see as a positive, we do then have a social responsibility to make sure that when those swimmers leave the sport, they're ready to transition successfully on to the next stage of their life. So as, as a national governing body in Australia, we're now starting to make sure that uh, our, our athletes are developing skills, uh, whether that's through formal qualifications or, or, or training or on the job experiences, so that when they finish swimming, they can transition to the next phase of their life. And there's nothing worse that someone's been earning you know, six, six figures a year regularly uh, and then all of a sudden that stops and they've got nothing to go to. And that's when the sport gets a bad image because we've had it in Australia, people who are past champions struggle in their lives and that creates uh, uh, negative publicity for the sport that we haven't looked after our swimmers, our top swimmers, our superstars. That's certainly an issue that we need to tackle at FINA. Uh, let's go to David and then we'll try and wind up because I think it's nearly time. Sorry? this side also one question. Sorry? this side also one question from one panel. One question this side. Oh, there were two. Okay, I thought that was the last question. Okay. Okay, thank right. you. Short, quickly, and also we'll get short answers from this end. And then we'll have that uh, person from that end then. Okay, mine is about uh, spectator attraction. And I wonder, who comes to watch the sport? If it's swimming, who comes to watch swimming? If it's soccer, who goes to watch soccer? And I want to give an example of my country, Kenya. Uh, when we are doing swimming, find parents, uh, the, the families, and their peers will come to watch the swimmers. Okay, um, if you go to athletics, we have one part of the country uh, where they just do athletics. If there's an athletic event there, the stadium is going to be full. We have other parts of the country uh, where we get our best soccer players. When there is a soccer game there, uh, the stadiums will be full. And then I wonder, if we are here and there is a, a judo championship... Keep, keep it short, please, there. David. Time is not on our side. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I don't know how many people will go. So what I was saying, uh, I wanted the panel uh, uh, to tell us, is there a relationship uh, between spectators with the contact with the game at an early age? Uh, for instance, if you played soccer, like most men did, they, they want to watch soccer. And if you're exposed to swimming at an early age, you want to watch swimming. Therefore, uh, FINA will need maybe to build more pools so that more people can get in contact and then come to watch swimming. Let's get that question from this end or the contribution, and then we'll get the panel to respond. I'll be brief. Um, I have really maybe a comment more than a question, and I, uh, I appreciate the enthusiasm, the answers to all the questions. Uh, they've been excellent, uh, the responses. And, and from my perspective, and, and being someone who's uh, in the United States uh, and understanding what is a mainstream sport and what's not a mainstream sport, I think that um, the, the best way that we can advance the sport of swimming um, will be giving people more of an appreciation of how difficult it is and they can relate to when someone uh, has a certain time and a certain race. When I think about mainstream sports uh, in the United States, people can relate to how many home runs are hit in a season or how many points 
per game you average in basketball or how many touchdowns you throw in football or international sports like golf. People can appreciate what it is to shoot under par uh, or tennis. So and for swimming, I think until um, more people appreciate how difficult it is and they can relate to that, I think that will be a hurdle for advancing the sport. And so I'll, I'll close with saying uh, the session that we started with this morning uh, where it was really promoting uh, swimming for life. I think when you get people in the sport at a young age and have them maintain the sport and then also continue to swim as adults and older in life, then they can go to swimming events and when someone uh, turns in a specific time in an event, whatever it might be, they can relate to that and they can appreciate that and see how difficult it is. And I think that will draw in more spectators and more people to the sport. Thank you. One other point I'd like to make, which came out this morning uh, by the uh, representative of MINEPS, Mr. Fuxa. Uh, he talked about family involvement. Uh, and to a large extent, swimming again, whether we like it or not, is parental involvement is very, very crucial than in, in most other sports. So I'd like to bring all that together and get some comments from here. And then at the same time, we'll make that your concluding remarks, if that's OK with you. Sure. Uh, you are correct um, in two regards. One, people can relate to home runs hit in a uh, season. My question to you would be, do you actually know what it is like to hit a 100 mile per hour fastball? Because I played baseball for 10 years, and I still couldn't tell you what a 100 mile per hour fastball comes by me. Um, but people can relate to that because of the number of times they've seen baseball and the number of uh, the statistics that help them. Uh, repetition. You, we constantly bombard them. I, I don't watch baseball at all. I actually could care less, uh, to be honest. But I see baseball all the time because I watch basketball. So I constantly see it. And football as well. Um, but we are, uh, we are designed to understand those concepts. Basketball, uh, baseball, all the mainstream sports. You are correct. That is partially because they don't understand exactly what we do, but the question is, how do we get them to understand that? And part of that is uh, continuing to do what we need to do. Having our top athletes compete at a high level consistently. And it doesn't have to be the, the top or the top level. We don't even breaking world records every day, but we need them competing against each other. We need Marco Koch, Koch racing Daniel Guta all the time. We need Katinka racing whoever else. We need big athletes racing a lot. Kate Campbell does an amazing job of swimming the 100 freestyle consistently all the time. And if I could go to Australia, we'd be there in a heartbeat because I want Katinka to race Kate Campbell because she's on, she's on fire. And Ledecky, we go out of our way to go to the US to race athletes like that because that's good for our sport. It's good for me as a coach, and I think it's good for our sport to have them racing all the time. That answers your question. You want to know who comes to see the sport? Well, two things. One is we need to turn around and we need to be getting our top athletes to race head to head more often. And I don't mean making events where only two athletes swim. I mean putting in Kate Campbell, Missy Franklin, uh, Natalie Coughlin, putting in Katinka with them and, and having them go at it and putting the top athletes all the time against each other, making, making a um, habit of seeing this. Having, we have LeBron James versus Kevin Durant all the time in the United States. And I watch it all the time in Europe. But it's a story. It's a storyline. And that's something we need to create. We don't have storylines because our athletes are not racing more often. Michael Koch is not racing Daniel Gutz all the time. It's not happening. We need it to happen more often. And that will get people to come to the stands. That will get people to take a side. You pick yes or no. You pick red, you pick B. Uh, a or B. You pick red or blue. You pick a side, you stand by that side, you get excited. Like, you st like soccer fans to Manchester United or whoever your team is. But you have a team and you stick to them. We also need to think outside the box. Off the top of my head, sell alcohol at these, convent at these uh, sporting events. Um, sports betting. I mean, put them on the board and figure out what we can do to make the sport legit. But... Obviously, you don't want to do it on the negative side, but things like that to get people in, that's marketing. It's just going out of our way to try and do it with the athletes we have. Thanks. Thank you very much, Shane. Michael? Uh, just very briefly, for me, a key thing is fan engagement. If you watch a lot of the professional sports, the engagement between the athletes and the fans uh, is, is critical, and I believe uh, we need to improve on that as a sport, how our swimmers engage with the fans at the, at the, at, at the competition. Um, that will help build their profile and also the sports profile. Uh, and secondly, um, we need more innovation. 
at, at, at uh, events. Uh, I remember when I ran the World Championships in 2007, uh, I think I saw Greg Bowman here before uh, from Great Big Events, but we sat down for a day and workshopped ideas. And one of them in water polo was that we put a speed gun on the ball as it was going into the net so people knew actually how fast it was. And it was amazing how much interaction that got from the crowd. Thanks, Michael. Gianni? No, I think that uh, I was uh, happy to hear Sean speaking about uh, the champion as to to have the opportunity to, to race head to head many times in, in, a, in a season. I agree completely with him because it's the only way out to grow. But before to reach this point, I think that uh, you have to convince all the coaches to think in this way because in other sport are the coaches and the, the agent that they don't want that the top champion race head to head. So I think that you have to prepare a mental revolution in the coaches, in the club and everything. And after this will be possible because it's a way in which you can grow in, in the interest. And I think that uh, uh, at the beginning I made a mistake. I, I, I called the first convention in Mar del Plata, no, it was Punta del Este. And in all this year I've seen that the discussion are growing. Are growing and are, uh, are touching new point. And I hope that in the future, next time and so on, we, we can also discuss about the future of the head-to-head -head between the champion with the, with the new system that is not too easy, but it depends by the official, by the federation, but especially by the mind of the coaches, because the coaches sometimes are too focused on their athlete and the, they don't look to the full picture. Yeah. Thank you very much, Gianni. We had an, you can see by the, or, or feel by the passion that has been delivered here, how genuine all three of them are, how deeply involved they are, and we could go on for another, all day, the rest of the day, and, and continue with this discussion. Unfortunately, we'll have to stop now. And uh, thank you very much. I think these three have given the FINA Bureau very many extra thoughts on how to innovate swimming, to move swimming forward, and I'm certain that members of the FINA Bureau have taken this into consideration and see where we go from there and to make swimming more exciting for everybody, for the swimmers, for the television uh, audience and for the spectators who are there and let's get this combination together. Thank you all three. <laughs>